Okay, hang on to your hats. Stuff isn't hard, but it takes some thought. It really does. I mentioned earlier that you could have a failure due to block shear. Sorry about that. One of us was destined to dump something on the floor, so. <laughs> Here is a plate bolted to a gusset plate. Here is, if the gusset plate is weaker than the plate, tears the whole uh, a block out of the gusset plate. Here is a beam with a coped end on it where they coped this end off so something would fit. If they were just going to bolt it to a column as you see here, then they probably wouldn't have bothered coping it and you wouldn't have that little block shear problem. That usually happens when you're bolting the incoming beam into something like this. into a girder. Thank you, sir. I'm not used to holding it that direction, but I'll... There's for an angle. Main reason I even brought it, we've already had a bunch of pictures of those. Here you see they were testing something. This particular, in fact, these two specimens failed on the ends, <clears throat> and they were still busy failing on the sides in shear. Rupture on net tension area. Here's a typical bolt after some severe loading. Here's the top plate and the bottom plate. You can tell it was in double shear because of this part's all crushed. And then this side is crushed. That's a lot of deformation for a bolt and it's still holding on nicely. It still has area of the bolt times F sub Y in shear, 0.6 F sub Y. <clears throat> okay, those are tension members. Now, compression members have one more aspect to them. They can still fail just due to pure old compression if they're nice and short, but once they start getting long, then you have problems with the section buckling. We already did some buckling in 305. We uh, determined that Mr. Euler was a whiz at predicting how much strength you get out of a compression member. Did a derivation for it. <clears throat> and that's what we're going to use in this uh, class also. You can read all of this. There are structural elements subjected to only an axial compressive force. Actually, sometimes the column will be subjected to bending also. And uh, then they call them beam columns. So you'll have to design them to resist both the uh, column action and the bending action. Uh, usually it's a vertical member, primary function to support loads from the top. Read all this. You should know what columns are all about. Three methods have been developed over the years. They each have their own adherence, people who just think it's the best way to do business. The AISC agrees they're all acceptable. Some may be more economical under certain situations, but when you get where you're going, they're going to probably use one of these methods. We'll talk about them later. One's called the direct analysis. One's called the effective length. That's mostly the one we'll use. I think one of the homework problems has one of the other ones. And the other one, the last one's called a first order analysis method. They're straightforward. It's just a matter of what you're planning on using. A lot of times you'll have a computer program that will already be set up to give you uh, what you need. These are actually the loads on the structure. In this chapter, we're just going to find out how strong the members are. 
And then we'll talk about taking the loads applied to the floors and things like that using one of these methods and getting the loads in your particular girder and your particular column. Column theory. You've been there. You've done that. You had a beam kicked out to the side. You put loads on it. You had a second order differential equation. You set up the equation for how far this thing deflected to the side, uh, depending on the load and all of that stuff. Pull it out of your 305 book or look at it here. We'll be fine. Squared y dx squared is equal to m over ei. That's right out of your 305 book. There's your differential equation. There's your assumed solution. You set your boundary conditions equal to appropriate quantities. For example, on a pinned, pinned column, you would tell the differential equation. You're going to integrate it a couple of times so that you can find m and delta. You're going to tell him on the at this point, you know the moment. Since it's pinned, there's none. At this end, it's pinned, and therefore there's no horizontal deflection. There is some here. There is some here. Down on this end, you tell him that, and he comes back and he tells you pi critical is equal to pi squared, n squared, pi squared, ei over l squared. Now, in 305, I don't know if we even mentioned. We might have, just so you wouldn't be confused about it now. We just had pi squared EI over L squared for the critical buckling load according to Euler. Truth is, the N was in there when you set one of these terms equal to zero. When X is equal to zero, Y is equal to zero. You were trying to get that term equal to zero. Sign of that was zero for zero, but that gave you no load. So you weren't interested in that solution. It is a solution. Or there could have been pi, which is the pi that shows up in the equation. Um, and that was the lowest number. But it could have also been 2 pi, which nobody really cared because with the n of 2, then you'd have four times as much load. And we figured we needed the first time the thing buckled. And so that's probably what you worked with the entire time. The fact that n could be a 2 and still get a 0 is possible, though. For example, here is for n is equal to 1. This is what the shape would look like. This is what it looks like if n is equal to 2. And you can force that to happen by putting a brace in the middle of the member. In other words, across the top here, you may have a floor, and it is pinned to the floor. And down here is a footing and you have it pinned to a steel plate on the footing. And if in between here you put some braces across the mid-height of the column, in other words, here's your structure. That's pinned at the bottom. I don't care if you want to fix it, but it's pinned in the one we have shown here. And if you come in here and you put a member across here, it doesn't have to be very big just has to be enough to prevent this from wanting to move and buckle in a two-node state. Then you're going to have to put some braces in here. Otherwise, the whole thing, they'll all just buckle like that. <clears throat> they'll all go together. So you're going to have to put some braces in there to make sure that that doesn't happen. And if you're willing to pay that money, you can make the column four times as strong. You can do it as many times as you think it's advantageous to you to do so. Uh, the solution was, the lower load was, you probably don't remember, but there's a defined quantity called the radius of gyration. It was the square root of the moment of inertia of the shape divided by its cross-sectional area. Somebody made you learn it. Somebody told you you'll make money with it someday. Somebody told you that its use will become quite uh, useful to you, but never showed you why. Well, here it is. In our equation for 
pi squared e i over l squared. If you substitute i it is equal to square both sides a r squared into this equation, then you get p critical is pi squared e i over l squared is pi squared e i a r squared divided by l squared is equal to this. And you say, so what's the difference? I can look up a and the radius of gyration in the book just like I can look up i in the book. Yeah, but if you're going to start talking about stresses, critical buckling stresses, then you take the load divided by a, that's this term divided by a, and the a drops out. Now then you have an equation for critical buckling stress. And a lot of times that's what we work with instead of loads. Take your choice. You'd want to remember that E for steel is 29,000. This is the slope in this straight line portion. If you get out into this section out in here, then E is not 29. E is 20. I'm sorry. E is 10. I'm sorry. E is 6. I'm sorry. E is 0. If you're going to load it out in that rate region, then when I tell you the buckling, critical buckling load is uh, pi squared E anything, you got the wrong E. You put in a 29, and when you gave me the stress at which it buckled, that stress came out here. So you've been using the wrong E. And I'm going to insist that you go find out what E is for the answer you gave me. And don't put 29, 20, 10. Uh, you're going to put in the right E. Once you put in the right E, then you put that back in this equation, and he'll tell you what the true buckling stress is. Except when you get that true buckling stress, and I say, well, okay, at least you admit it's not here. Now you say it's here. Say, oh, okay, I feel this coming on again. Yeah, that's right. You got the E wrong again. And it takes an iterative, iterative solution to really home in on the answer. Now, for this steel, you know, you may not care. In other words, if it goes above the yield, you say, okay, forget that. It doesn't go above yield anyway. Even... Even if you think it's buckling, it's not buckling. All the little fibers are, are shot. But when you get some nice high-strength steels like we use, then the stress-strain diagram looks kind of like that. And so you were right. Tw uh, 29 KSI was right for a while. But then while you're really out here still working, and maybe before you even get to what they call F sub Y, that tangential modulus of elasticity has changed. So now it's a serious problem. Now you're going to have to go in and change it and redo the load and get the stress and redo the uh, E. And once you do that, you got to redo. It's an iterative solution. As you might imagine, most engineers aren't going to like that. They're going to say, look, you got something a little better that's close enough. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, this is where this is coming from. So here's an example. We've got a 12 by 50 wide flange. Davila. Davila. How much does this thing weigh? 50 pounds a foot. That's right. My point at the 12 didn't influence you at all, did you? Hilbig. Uh, what color is it painted? Doesn't have a color. Doesn't know. The, the specification doesn't. What is that for? I thought that was uh, number 12 paint. Now, what is that? Not the paint color, he says. It is the height. It's approximate height. It's in the 12 by series. It's around 12 inches deep. Some of these things, I don't know, maybe even in the 12 bys, the suckers will get 13, 14 inches deep because they were started off as 12 buys and they just got rolled thicker and thicker and thicker. But it's about the, the depth. It's supposed to hold a load of 145 kips. That load there is 
Somebody's already put a 1.4 on a dead and a 1.2 dead, 1.6 live, plus 0.5 snow, plus, 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 plus. They've already done all that. This is what they want you to hold up. It's got a name of P sub U. 20 feet long, ends are pinned. He says, without regard to load factors, because he says he's already put them in here, and without regard to the fact that you're getting ready to tell me a number that we can't use, you're getting ready to give me the nominal strength. He says, don't worry about the resistance factor right now. Is this thing going to be stable? What is, in effect, the average of a 1,000 tests without taking into account that a few of them were not so good? He says, you don't need to know the grade of steel because uh, grade of steel, 50 KSI? No. Uh, 90 KSI? No. Well, it's not in the equation, so nobody cares. Uh, it's a pen pinned column, so K is 1. In other words, you're on node, node 1, one node. Uh, you know pi, you know E, you know I about the weak axis, you know the length, you should be able to find out how much the thing will carry. For a W12 by 50 on page 126, that's where we'll get the area if we need it. There are our equations for critical stress, two versions of critical load, one with a moment of inertia, one with AR squared in it. Here is where we we'll get the moment of inertia or the radius of gyration, whichever version of the equation you select to use to get load or stress or whatever. It has a strong axis, 391 inches to the fourth resistance to bending. What's the resistance about the weak axis? 56.3. Ah, that's good. You revived at just the right time there. Be careful, you're going to hit your head falling on your desk there. And it has radius of gyration. That's uh, uh, listed as big one, little one. We're going to be using this one because if you have a pinned, pinned column, nobody said anything about bracing it in the middle. You would brace the weak axis, obviously. Then when it fails, it's going to fail in a single node. For that, he says the Minimum strength radius of gyration is the weak axis number, 1.96. 1.96, that's true. I'm sorry? Not always. Let me show you one where you don't, where you have braced it there and braced it there and braced it there with little braces across like that. Then it may pop out about the strong axis. It's hard for you to see, but I'm raising the pencil and I'm bringing it back down. It'll buckle about its weak axis because you braced it like crazy about the small axis. And what you're really going to be looking for is you're going to be looking for a L over R for this little guy or an L over R for this one. So I can't tell you that for sure, but we will. You would always brace the weak axis. It would be pointless to brace the strong axis. The strong axis in this case already isn't buckling. All right, so we're taking the minimum number of 1.96. The biggest L over R we find is 20 feet times 12 inches and a foot. You'd be surprised how many people forget that. It's easy to do if the guy doesn't write his units down here. That's 20 feet long divided by 1.96 inches. If you write the units, you'll find out there's a problem there in a hurry. You need a 12 inches per foot. Gives you a, this is called the slenderness ratio, as you know. And you will be looking for the maximum slenderness ratio, depending on how it's braced and the properties of the column. And then you plug it in the equation for load, pi squared e a divided by the slenderness ratio squared, pi e. Incidentally, you better be within that straight line part now, times area divided by slenderness ratio squared, 
278.9 kips. He says the applied load is on only 145, and you've got available 278.9, so it's stable, and it has a factor of safety of how much it could take divided by what you requested of uh, round two. What is the real stress? Well, the real stress in your column is 145. Well, let's let's don't. I'm not going to use 145. I'm going to use the 278 because you told me 278 was how much it could take. So I'm going to use a 278.9. Somebody got a calculator? Divided by was it 14.1? Six. Thank you. Square inches. What is the real stress in that column? 19 point something? Okay. Well, that's well below yield for all the steels. And therefore, I am happy that you are in the straight line portion. That's less than F sub Y for anything I know. So that would be an appropriate number to pick. Now, there's a discussion that I, in effect, have already discussed. He says they found out a long time ago, once they put the real loads on there, the things buckled much earlier than they thought. Then they realized the reason why was you were sticking 29 in there, but you were trying to pick up this much load or this much stress, meaning that the E that you input into this I, into this equation, was incorrect. So it turned into an iterative solution. Uh, the real data shows that Mr. Euler's equation is 100% correct, 100% correct, 100% correct. Because Mr. Euler is not saying the failure would occur at this point. He's saying it will not buckle until you put this much load on it. So here I have a column. It's one inch tall. It's on a concrete thing. And when I put the load on it, Mr. Euler says that will not fail in buckling. I'm not talking about anything else, he says. It will not fail in buckling until you get 2 million PSI on it. Okay, well, I tell him I have no interest in that. You've exceeded F sub Y. He says, what? I says, you have exceeded F sub Y. He says, what? I don't know what you're talking about. I'm a buckling guy. I'm telling you when that thing will buckle. Say, okay, I can see this guy is a buckling guy. He's not interested in the fact that the fibers have already turned into jello. Somebody go do some testing and tell me what to put on this column for the real load. Test, 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 test. Order's right, order's right, order's right. Uh, order's really wrong here. And the guy says, well, that shouldn't surprise you. You know the number's not going over F sub Y. No matter what this thing, if it didn't come in at F sub Y, then it can't be right past some break point. Below a break point, you're going to have to use a different equation. And if you can't come up with a different equation that's reasonable to use, then you're going to have to just fit a curve in all that data and we'll just go according to that equation. So, no, I've got an equation. He says, uh, it really sucks. You've got to do a trial and error to get the right curve. So these are called empirical solutions where we take the data and we take the data, we take the, the derivations, the theory, and we piece them all together and we fit a curve in there that seems to do nicely. And that's what we've done for things when these things buckle inelastically, where some of the fibers are already going into the yield. Usually they're going into the yield because they're always a little crooked. So there's always a little moment. And so this fiber on this side is yielding a little bit, and that fiber is yielding a little. These are nice and still elastic. Uh, but because some of these are failing, you're in a range they call inelastic buckling. Out in this region, if the, if the column buckles and you can get the load off of it before it collapses, if you'll get the load off, it'll go back to perfectly straight. In the inelastic region, if it buckles and you don't put any more load on it, on a testing machine, that's the way you put load. You do it you know, by deforming it. 
If you take the load off, it's not going to go back to straight because you have uh, yielded some of the fibers. Now, effective length, we could just redo the entire derivation. You say, well, we didn't do the derivation in the first place. Yes, we did. You and I in 305 did that derivation. And all we would do is we would pick our new case. Our old case was no deflection, no moment, no deflection, no moment. If you have a fixed, fixed case, we would say, he'd say, do you know the numbers anywhere? i say, yes, I do. No deflection and uh, no theta. See how it didn't rotate? And right here, there's no deflection and there's no theta. See how it didn't rotate? I didn't tell you no moment because I don't know what the moment is. So that's not a boundary condition. You plug those boundary conditions into the equation, and he'll come back and he'll tell you exactly how the thing fails and how much load you can put on it. This particular one that he's describing here, let's uh, see what he's doing here. Uh, this is, I think he would say what it is. I know what it is from the formula. It's pinned and it's fixed. Other end conditions can be in general bending moments are non homogeneous a boundary condition be different than original one form is this so and so for consider. Here we go. A member pinned at one end and fixed against rotation and translation on the other. So this is what he's talking about. He's talking about a buckling situation where it looks like that. If you put that in, this is what you'll come up with. Two point oh five pi squared e i over L squared, uh, and also an N in there. Ours didn't have the 2.05. Now, if you'll divide, if you put a 1 over number like a 0.7, uh, 0.7 squared, 1 over 0.7 squared, that's 2.05. Somebody noticed that and so said, look, it's a little more convenient to put it down here. And I say, why? What difference does it make? It's there or there. I says, well, you'll notice that this 0.7 here looks like 0.7 times the original length that the thing was when it came in a box. So, he says, that's where the pin is. That's where this thing stops being bent this way and starts being bent that way. And therefore, the length between pins, there's a pin, a lot of moment, not a pin, not a lot of moment, not a pin, a lot of moment, not a pin, a pin that right there is 0 0.7 times the true length, for this is the true length. So, okay, so what you're saying is if I ever see one of these, just measure it as it comes out of the box before we install it, get L true, and if I intend to pin it and fix it, then in my Euler's equation I put the effective length, which is K times L. Say, do you happen to have a K for this one? He says, I do. Says, you happen to have a K for this one? He says, I do. Because I'm going to just count it. Pin, here's the load on top of it. Moment, moment, deflection, deflection. Okay, here's the other half. Go dig up any column, any flagpole on earth. You'll find we always put another half under the ground. Uh, maximum moment, not so max moment, little bit of moment, no moment, no moment, pin, pin. <laughs> Effectively, a column, a freestanding column is how long? That's not the right question. Effectively, a freestanding column is how long? How far is it from here to here? Not, well, that's just, no, L isn't a good enough number. It's L what? L out of the box. L true. That's correct. How long is this mirror? So how long is the column effectively? Two. That's right. Here is the column he was discussing. The true length out of the box was 30 feet or something. When you installed it with those in condition, 
you force this pin to come down to this point, and it turns out from the derivation, it's 7 tenths of L true. That's called the L effective, the effective length. Yes, sir. Have I ever lied to you? Go get a shovel. You'll see. Every flagpole has another flagpole in the ground underneath it. Oh, you got me there, don't you? <laughs> okay, well, there's not really another half underneath the ground. <laughs> Whatever's in a box is all you get. They steal half of it before they send it to you. So L true, this is 30 feet, but your effective length on the column is how long? 60 feet, 2L, that's correct. As long as you do that, I don't care how what mental process you use. All right, and he talks about more. KL is the effective length. K is the effective length factor. He says we've got some others in table CA 7.1. Uh, there are theoretical and recommended values for design. You can use the theoretical values uh, under really strange conditions and under very... Uh, going to really be expensive because the truth is it's very difficult to really fix something in many instances. Not hard to make a pin out of it. That That's easily done. Um, so let me see. Let me get that table right quick before we go any further. It's on page 16.1511. Here is a fixed, fixed column. Theoretically, we just found, well, we didn't just find, but this thing has got an axis of symmetry like this, and then there's another one going the other way, and then there's another one going like this. These are at the quarter points, and therefore the effective length of this column would be half of its boxed length half its true length. Here you see the theoretical value was 0.7 for a pinned fixed. Here's one where the column was allowed to translate but not rotate. Here's the upper half. Here's the lower half. It is effectively pin, maximum moment, pin, it is effectively L long. That's what he says right here. The effective length is 1 times the true length. This is the one you and I did in 305 and for which he has the full derivation for. Here's the flagpole, 2.0 theoretical. And here is an upside down flagpole fixed at the top and pinned at the bottom. It has an effective length of two times the box length. The truth is, though, when you try and really make this thing not rotate, it has a tendency to rotate. And it's really difficult to stop it. The plate will bend. The connection will bend. The whole footing will roll over a little bit. It doesn't take very much, and it really pretty much ruins this thing it doesn't run it all the way down to no good at all, but they don't want you using 0.5 unless you've got some really extraordinary circumstances and can show it. They want you using a 0.65. Same way on this one. This is very easily done in the field. This is not easily done in the field. The 0.7, they want you to drop to 0.8, meaning this 7 tenths, uh, 10 foot column is a 7 foot column. They want you to say it's an 8 foot column. I'm not going to ask you to make it a 10 foot column because you do have some effective change in the behavior, but they only want it to be shortened from a 10 down to an 8 foot column. In this case, they want you to go with a 1.2 instead of a 1. In this case, a 1 is fine. In this case, it's not easy to really fix that footing on the ground. They want you to go from a 2 to a 2.1. 
This is a fixed pinned column. This is a fixed pinned column too. That's interesting. In this case, they make you go to a 2.1, but when you turn it upside down, it's a 2. I don't make any sense at all. Interestingly, it really does. Everything these people do makes sense. You got a column that's fixed on a footing in the ground, that footing can rotate. 2 to a 2.1, please. You got a footing that's pinned to, you got a column that's pinned to a footing, but is welded to a girder. Now that's a different matter. Uh, that, that's that's kind of doable. I mean, you can weld it to another piece of steel. You're not just bolting it to a piece of concrete in the soil. And in that case, they say, good enough, you can use a two. All right, back to this. This is what the code, this is what the specifications called for by the codes will insist that you follow. Number one, go find me the critical buckling strength. Multiply times the gross area. That's the nominal load. You will have to multiply that times an appropriate resistance factor to bring your P nominal down to something that I feel is safe under all conditions, even if you bring out the worst one that anybody's made in 10 years. Then you will make sure that your nominal load times that 0.9 will be greater than the requested piece of U. Piece of U is uh, 1.2 dead and so on. Resistance factor is 0.9, so specified on uh, page 16.1-31 in the uh, specs. And piece of U less than that, of course, that's the whole purpose they're going to pay you. Now, here are kind of pictures of these things. Case A. Case A is fixed, fixed. All right, this one might, you might be able to get away with fixed, fixed. There it's fixed because it's welded to a steel beam. There it's fixed because it's welded to the first floor beam. I don't think you're going to get away with that on the next floor down where it's bolted to a concrete footing. You might get away with that there. You'll notice that this is fixed, fixed with no translation because in the frame they put brace rods. So when the wind came and pushed on it, this rod got tight and this point did not move with respect to the support beneath it. Here is a fixed pin. Here they welded it like crazy. And here they put angles in there and they bolted it. These little angles, I mean, you could beat somebody to death with them in a hurry. But they're not really very strong. They're just stronger than the guy at the bar's head. When this thing wants to roll, these things don't have a chance. They just open up. And this one just collapses. Not a lot, but it only takes a little bit, and this is a pin. So this would be case B. Case B, pinned at the top, fixed at the bottom, or upside down. There isn't one of those, so this one you can just turn it upside down. Here it's fixed at the top and pinned at the bottom. Braced, no translation. Here's a frame where the guy forgot to put the braces in there. And so when you put the load on it, what it wanted to do, it wanted to fall over to the side. So that's case C. Case C, that's how you got that translation. It is fixed. Yes, it's welded nicely to a nice big girder. And it's fixed on the bottom. So that's case C, fixed, fixed. Case E is pinned, fixed. Case E is pinned, fixed. Truth is, I think that this case would also be applicable to this one because you got one end pinned and you have the other end reasonably fixed on the bottom. Flanges. You could probably get away with using uh, the 2.0 as opposed to the 2.1. There's case C and E. There's case D. 
pinned on top, pinned on bottom. That's the pin pin column. You'll have to put braces in here, or you'll have to stop this thing from translating somehow, or otherwise it'll just fall on the ground. Case F, fixed at the top, pinned at the bottom. You'll notice I used angles, so I can say pinned. Put them angles in there. It's a pin connection. Okay, first, we're going to define pi squared E A divided by KL over R squared as the Euler buckling load, so we'll subscript it with an E. Got such a little E, I couldn't see it. The critical buckling load according to Euler. The stress is P over A, so it's pi squared E divided by KL over R squared. A cancels A. We were talking about times when Euler's load gave us a good number. Euler's load gives us a very good number as long as you are above to the right of this break point. That break point is where these two curves seriously diverge. This region is called the elastic region. If you get the load off, the thing will come back straight. Round in here, the fibers are starting to yield. This is the inelastic region. The break point divides when you have an inelastic versus elastic behavior. Now, because Euler's perfect, but Euler assumes that the load is right down the center, not really possible, and the member is perfectly straight, that's the worst part of it all. It just can't be. A few of them are, but some are bent to the right and some are bent to the left. They put in a factor to take, it, take that into account. And they spent a fortune finding out what that number is by taking a bunch of roll shapes that came out of a, a rolling mill and testing it. 0.877. It's an experimentally derived number. This is AISC equation E33. It's on page 16.1-33. If, on the other hand, you are to the left of the break point in the inelastic region. This is the equation that best fits the data that we have found. You'll notice that when the yield stress is 36, and Euler says, I don't know why it quit at 36, because this number here ought to be a million, then 36 over a million is zero, and anything raised to the zero is one, and the critical buckling stress is the yield stress. So it's coming in right where we want it to. Not only that, it has the properties that the two curves aren't perfectly tangent, but they're, you know, there's a little kink in the curve, but not much, and they are both at the same height at the break point. So here it is again. This is what region? Inelastic, this one is, and there's your break point. Where in the world do they get that from? I don't know, one million, two million bucks, who knows? But it was very cheap rather than having a bunch of things fall down or putting columns that were too big when you didn't need them. 4.71 times the square root of the modulus of elasticity divided by the yield stress of the metal. They got that from taking a 36 KSI yield metal, 50 KSI yield metal, they didn't have to worry that much. That's, that was 29 for everything. And that's where the break point occurs. That's where Mr. Euler's formula really diverges from uh, what we see in the field. So if you are to the left of this point, you ought to be on that weird equation. You ought to be on this inelastic 0.658 raised to the Fy over Fe power multiplied times F sub Y. If you're to the right of it, F sub E is perfect, except the things aren't perfectly straight. The fact that they're not perfectly straight is already included in this number also. 0.877 times F sub E. Once you find that critical buckling stress, you multiply it the, times the gross area of the shape, and you got how much load that column will carry. We'll tell you that beams, see, columns only have two regions. Beams are going to have three regions. 
So you're going to have to have two break points. To the left of this break point, you'll be using one idea. In here, you'll be using a straight line idea. And in here, you'll be using a Timoshenko idea. So what I say, hang on to your belts. Uh, all he's doing here is repeating what he did. The only difference is, rather than giving you a break point in terms of KL over R, you got to calculate that anyway, so I don't really see any reason to, to do it another way. But there's also, if there's a break point there, then there's a break point here, and that break point is 2.25, the ratio of F sub Y over F sub B. So I just scratched it out. It's up to you. You can use either one. This one right here would say, uh, if your yield stress is less than F sub B, uh, over F sub B is less than 2.25, you're either on one side or the other side of the curve. As long as you can remember one of them, you're okay. Here's where it is. Chapter E, 16.1-31. dash Here's the first thing he talks about is your resistance factor for compression members. Talks about the effective length. Now, yes, you told me once, Mother. Global buckling. Global buckling means the whole thing is buckling, as opposed to a little piece of the column buckling. We'll get into that later. Here is your equation. Nominal strength is critical times gross. Here is your critical. There's your uh, inelastic equation. And here is your elastic equation. You'll have to check out your personal KL over R for your personal column and see if it is to the right of this magic number or to the left of this magic number for your steel. Uh, and he tells you how to get F sub B. That's just Euler's buckling stress. This is for local buckling. We'll cover it next time. And I just put these pages with the global buckling just so they would be available to us. All steels, inelastic, elastic. For a yield of 50 KSI, which is usually what we use for columns. This number comes at 4.7Y1 times the square root of 29,000 divided by 50. It's 113. It's a number that gets imprinted in your brain before too long. And you go find the KL over R. If it's above 113, you're using the uh, elastic equation, this one. To the left, you're using this one for the critical buckling stress. Uh, they also suggest that you don't use KL over R's over 200. They don't care if you do, but if you got a KL over R over 200, it's going to be so inefficient. It's just not going to carry any load at all. And so nobody in their right mind goes past that number. Here's an example. Got this wide flange made out of 50 KSI steel, 20 feet long, pin pinned. He wants to compute the compressive strength. He gets the KL over R, 96. He checks the break point, 4.7129 over 50. There's that 113. That 50 came from page 2 48. 96 is to the left of the break point. We're going to be using break points like crazy in here. Since you're to the left of the break points, you ought to be using that uh, goofy equation. The goofy equation needs a 0.658. I got it. It needs an F sub Y. I got it. It needs an F sub B. I don't got it. It says, okay, here it is. Pi squared E divided by Kelly R squared, 30.56. Do the math. 25 KSI. Here's where you get the areas, where you get the radio of gyration. Uh, that's where I worked it out by hand. Multiply the critical buckling stress 
times the cross-sectional area, get 549 kips. You only get nine-tenths of it. And nine-tenths of it is 495 kips. That's how much you can put on there. See you next time. Yes, sir. Yes. One factor is, is, is like a, what you learn in 305 is given by book. The, the, the book, a year in my 305 book, has the same values as they use. Okay. What I was going to ask you, and they have a recommended, you know, like a, a length factors, which is one line underneath it. Uh, we, we do. You use, are you going to really design for the real world? Then you need the practical value. Exam, you're going to use practical values? Absolutely, in this class. And the, uh, well, it, it is. Now, in the 305 class, you weren't told there were two values because we'd have to explain why. You know, and that takes some maturity that you now have. But back then, we had nothing but theory. Thank you. Sure. Let me, sh let me shut this down. I saw you leaving.